three families are about to go back in time. I feel almost like I've been sentenced to five months hard labor. You could have the best intentions of coming out and, and starting a life here, and before you know it, you're bust. It's not quite as charming as it once was, and the Garden of Eden has turned into hell. Fictionalized, mythologized, often romanticized. Now, see the real experience of life on the frontier. Funding for Frontier House is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The foundation also seeks to portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. Corporate support is made possible by... Bob's Red Mill Natural Foods, makers of over 400 stone ground whole grain products for every meal of the day. Our all-natural products are available at your local grocer or natural foods market. Bob's Red Mill Natural Foods, to your good health. And by Georgia Pacific. Life on the frontier would have been different with GT brands like Quilted Northern Bath Tissue, Brawny Towels, and Dixie Cups and Plates. Georgia Pacific. We make the things that make you feel at home. Major funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Nothing captures the epic adventure of America's pioneers better than the image of wagon trains rolling across the Wild West. It's a romantic vision that hides a harsh reality. I wanted to walk the land one step at a time to try to get in the shoes of the guys that walked here before us. Now the question will be answered. Can three modern families carve a small community of homesteads out of the Montana wilderness? I hope that we just make it. I hope to see the families really come together in a spirit of wanting to come together. Foot sore from two days of overland travel, they can now see their destination, Frontier Valley. Alas, we're almost at the promised land. It's, it's beautiful. After dreaming about it for the last three months to finally have an opportunity to sit up here and look down the valley, it's, it's humbling. It makes you silent. Each family is about to discover their new home sites, which lie half a mile apart along Frontier Creek. In the 1880s, many families gave up everything they knew for 160-acre claims they had never seen. Only when they arrived would they realize what they were up against. A lucky few homesteaders got claims with a finished cabin. Good, I've reached for the flight switch. From Tennessee, nurse Karen and teacher Mark Glenn and Karen's two children have a claim that comes with an abandoned miner's cabin, even a few sparse furnishings. Oh, God, check out the stove. That guy looks mean, Mom. I don't want him hanging over my bed. See, all the way as far as you can see, all the way up to that mountain, all the way around, is our land. California executive Gordon and housewife Adrienne Clune, along with four children, have hired carpenters to get their cabin started. This has to be the most beautiful place on earth. You can see it's, it's like paradise. It really is. It's like heaven. Heaven on earth here. Oh, so glad to be here. 
This is so good. I'm, think, I'm crying because I'm happy, not because I'm sad. I'm just happy. Finally, be in her own place. <sighs> I think we got the crown jewel, Pop. Yeah, I think so. It's beautiful. Select a site yet for building? No, well, that's gonna take a while. At the top of the valley, Boston teacher Nate Brooks and his father Rudy have what was the most typical scenario. They must construct a home out of whatever they can find on their land. You excited? Yeah, great. Just hope as I can reach the end. <laughs> you make it, Pop. The first morning on the land, and the Glens are waking up in their cabin. Hey, come on, we need some new gatherers. That's cool. That's what each goes on the earth. I kind of feel really guilty that our plot of land had the housing on it. Um, you know, there's a family here that's, that's big or they could use the housing. You know, if they don't want to sleep outside, and I wouldn't blame them one bit. Yeah, just let them bring in their mattresses. We'll sweep it up, clean it up. So I really hope that they will take that offer. Well, good morning. What's up? It's about time that boy woke up. Hey, Pop. What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? The other two families are living in eight by ten foot tents. Check this out here. This is the Clune Mansion. We have three Clunes still living here. Grace, you want to stick your head out? Can you find your head, sweetie? We are really cramped, six people in a tent. I needed to kind of stretch out because my legs were sore from walking so much yesterday. I'm in the bed last night and freezing and shivering. I'm like thinking, why did Gordon <laughs> ever talk me to this? Oh God! Only four and a half months to go. <laughs> it's in. Spurred by the misery of tent life. The families take on their most immediate need, building shelter. Nate Brooks still has to harvest the raw materials. Go, Warren, go. Run, go. Nice shot. Some initial tasks are so dangerous that experts have to guide the families for the first few days. Thank you, Mr. Tree. Get up, get up, baby. Nate's cabin will require at least 21 more trees. The last half of the 19th century saw forests felled at a phenomenal rate. Expanding America was clearing timberland equal to the size of Connecticut each year. Down at the Clunes cabin, the carpenters have already hewn 60 trees into notched and peeled logs. Now Gordon has to take charge of putting it all together. It's a far cry from back home where he's just paid for a mansion to be built in Malibu. From where I come from, um, a lot of the work that we would have around the home is done by outside help. I haven't mowed a lawn in, you know, 16 years, so therefore my children haven't mowed a lawn in their lives. It's been a long time since I had one of these. Oh, I've definitely been swinging the hammer all day today. It's pounding, moving up logs, and it feels good. God, it feels good. While the men are working, it's up to the women to prepare the food. Using only supplies brought in on their wagon, Adrienne has six hungry mouths to feed. Without a cabin or a wood stove, her tools are primitive. Everything must be cooked over open fire. This is, this is baking. This is how I'm baking all our food, all our bread, everything. This is a camp that uh, there are holes underneath it. So you're baking it from the bottom and from the top. I'm really definitely thinking about frontier women a lot and thinking about how, how they did it. It's just constant. It's, it's like the whole day preparing food, boiling water, you know, to be able to come down to your kitchen and have a cup of tea or coffee in five minutes. That's worth a lot. 
We've come a long way, I tell you. We really have. We've come a long way. We get here, we gotta we gotta get animals taken care of, we gotta get food going, we gotta get fire going, we gotta figure out water source, we got to get wood supplies. It's pretty much everything at once. Thank you for the food you have provided us to nourish our bodies, and thank you for the table that we eat on in the house that we live in. Thank you for this wonderful family and all the hands that go together to make everything work. Uh, there's no task that's too small and none that's too great. All are important here. And thank you for the help of Nate and uh, Rudy today and helping out neighbors. Amen. 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 After three cold nights, Karen is upset that the Clunes haven't accepted her hospitality. I offered to let all the children um, stay in the cabin. It was real important to me that they feel like this was part of, you know, their destination and that they had reached um, their goal. And, and Gordon didn't want to let them do that, and that really disappointed me. He's, he's very difficult to be nice to. And it seems like um, every time I try to do something, it's just met with such roughness or friction. He's very difficult to like. And, and I'm at the point where I don't even want to try anymore. While the Clunes have refused Karen's offer of shelter for their children, they have accepted it for their animals. The Clunes don't have a corral, so they use the one that came with the Glen's cabin. <laughs> Going. Crystal, the Glen's milk cow, has recovered from her illness and now shares her corral with the Clunes cow, Blanca, and their two calves. Uh, Blanca. Luckily, Karen's daughter Erin is proving a natural with the animals and is already at home with the experience. I thought I'd never live without my television or my radio. I was like, oh, I'm going to miss it so bad. I'm going to have to get somebody to tape all my shows. But I don't need it. It's more fun just hanging out here without watching television. I think I was made to be born in 1983. I just, like, got mailed wrong or something. <laughs> oh! Up at the Brooks, Nate is eagerly anticipating the day his fiancée, Kristen, will arrive. I can't wait for her to come out. She's going to be, uh, she's going to be surprised. Hopefully we'll have the, the cabin up and running and, uh, yeah, I can't, can't wait for her to come. Nate and Kristen will be married here in Frontier Valley in a little over five weeks. But so far, the two men are making slow progress with the cabin which makes them doubt claims in history books that such simple shelters could be built in a handful of days. In a gesture of communal goodwill, Gordon Clune and Mark Glenn give up precious time to help Nate build. I think Gordon and I both could uh, you know, put our, ourselves in Rudy and Nate's position of her coming out here and it, how important a cabin is to be done. Um, and having a roof over her head. So there's nothing that we want to do to try to ensure that this, this is ready when she gets here. And that we're not going to ever be a complete community as far as the three families until we get a roof over their head. Spring storms provide further incentive for everyone to get their families under cover. Uh, storm moving in, they get some rain. You're so vulnerable and susceptible to the elements, to the weather. My boots were soaking wet and, and freezing cold and and I could barely walk from the tent to the fire to start the fire to warm my feet to then think about you know making a meal to then going back to cowering in the tent the cold and the wet is uh, you know it's part of the game to live this kind of lifestyle it's a challenge I 
I think the reality of being in 1883 is uh, different than what you might have envisioned. It was going to be milking some cows on occasion and riding horses and a nice, beautiful log cabin. I don't think we had a clear, realistic picture of what 1883 was all about. A nice job. Thanks. The nice potatoes. We had a really big rainstorm, so as you notice, I didn't get a chance to really wash up that well. <laughs> <laughs> I just crawled into the tent. That's that. I feel guilt. I feel guilt, Gordon Clune bringing out my family out here. The homesteader guy busted his hump out here, and uh, I'm feeling like he is right now. I'm a little tired, and I'm ready to go to sleep. It's the last day for the carpenters at the Clune cabin, which is going up quickly. However, lifting the final 350-pound logs up two stories is dangerous. So Mark Glenn and Nate Brooks come to help out. There should be two people that are on the other side of the staging, I think, that are holding that. Okay, so when we get it, when we get you, get it from you, we should talk Neighboring about is a lost art in, a, in our society. We're such a, a mobile culture, it's rare to really get to know your neighbors or invest any great deal amount of energy into the art of neighboring. So hopefully that's one of the things that comes out of this experience. I feel emotional. This is cool. This is kind of neat to be part of a team to build a log cabin. It feels really good. So it's going to be part of that. Mark Glenn has been working on everyone's homestead but his own. Yet his gesture of goodwill causes an unexpected crisis. Good for breakfast. The dogs my feet of breakfast again. I baked scones in the Dutch oven and started up here. Go back to the fire. And I come back, and this is on the ground, empty. So, like, half an hour's work this morning or more, just gone down the dog's stomach. I just can't believe this, I swear. Adrienne blames Duke, Mark's dog, who's been following him as he's been working on the Clune's cabin. Equally suspect, though, is the Clune's dog, Idaho, who is nursing four hungry puppies. I feel awful. I mean, I can't even feed my children. I got all that trouble, get up early, get the fire going, make scones, and they were beautiful. Now three three of our kids are gonna go hungry till lunch is ready. They get no breakfast. Because some people can't keep their dogs where they should be. Which dog ate the biscuits? Was it was yeah, it this one. Was it really? How do you know? Because he he can't right when mom after mom screamed, he ran over this way. Do you think it was him and not Idaho? It wasn't Idaho I wouldn't do that. Oh, mom okay. said it wasn't Idaho, mom okay. said. Anyway, the dog shouldn't even be here, but you know, no. since, since Mark's here working, his dog can be here. Yeah. Can't you come on down for a minute? I got a uh, baked potato with cheese and bacon and cornbread. Hi, Nate. Hey, Gordon. How are your women folk? I hear they're having one traumatic event after the other. I think everything's fine. We're doing great. I heard this morning about one of the dogs, and it's always this kind of stuff. When it's one of the dogs, it means that was probably somebody else's dog. Um, got just some biscuits or something like that. But I think it's uh, much ado about nothing. I'm pretty sure it was Idaho because she was taking food to her pups. Yeah, that makes sense. Gordon, he told the girls that, like, I and Tracy, that... Next time our dogs came over to their campsite or ate their food or whatever, that he was going to shoot them. He can't shoot a tin can. Get a wipe. Ugh. The 
and now I'm trying to make split pea soup for supper, but I can't cook through the bone here. I won't cook through, so. Mmm, that's mad because we're supposed to have a milk bucket, but Justin's not really doing anything. Oh my god. After less than a week, the two teenage clone girls are growing tired of frontier life. Their biggest complaint is walking twice a day to milk at the glens. It sucks. I hate milking. The cows smell, they step in the crap. All they do is meal and they have to shoo the flies away. It takes an hour to milk and then we have to walk back for an hour and take the milk bucket that's full and it spills all over our dresses. And then we have to do it again after that. And pretty much by the end of the day we walked four miles. And it really sucks. She's done. Anya and Tracy have been complaining a bit about the work. Yeah, it's been tough for them. They're starting to say they want to go to the beach, they want to go to dinner. This morning they asked me, why did you and Dad sign up for this? And I said, because I thought it was going to be fun. They're like looking at me like, you know, you were so far off. To make matters worse, a rumor is circulating in the small community that Anya and Tracy have broken the rules by smuggling in modern goods. Afraid of being exposed, they decide to confess. We just want to confess that Anya snuck in makeup and I had her bring in my eyelash crimper. All we did really was wash our hair in the creek with shampoo, herbal essence. Yeah, and we put it in a honey bottle thing. And I didn't even know my mom brought the shampoo. So Yeah, I was a surprise. We're like, yeah, shampoo. And then we kind of got over it. Over, like, and we didn't even use that much. Yeah, we just used it. So I mean, we used some face wash. I haven't used face wash. Well, we tried, but it never no, we didn't. Out. We didn't use it because we didn't get a chance to go to the creek. Well, my mom used it. Mm. Oh, she did. Yeah. But from now on, we're gonna get rid of all our modern stuff because it's pointless to even bring it. Cause we don't even care what we look like, even though we look like crap. I know. Well, at least we have the ability to look better when we have makeup on. Yeah. I think that's like enough. <laughs> we're gonna bury our stuff, mm -hmm. and we feel really bad, so we're sorry. And hopefully, no one else rats us out because there's nothing else to rat out. There's a tree way over there all by itself, so we're gonna go bury it under the tree. Oh, and yeah. be dead for five months. Now, Karen has nothing bad to say about us because we're not sneaking anything in anymore. I asked Gordon if any of her, the women were going through any more tragedies because it just seems like such a farce that it's comical. It's the makeup, it's the shampoo, a dog eating a biscuit. In the 1800s, you wouldn't even be considering this kind of garbage. You know, if you didn't want to let go, don't do this. You know? I mean, how uncreative. Hey, it's, it's funny. Get a, get a grip. Start learning and, and doing what you need to be doing. I'm not from the West Coast, but so far, they, they're different. They're hard, to, they're hard to get close to. They're hard to help. Karen is offended by the clunes, who are now voicing complaints about the project. Gordon, for instance, is grumbling about the distance he has to go to fetch water. I think it's a ridiculous long way. But who am I to complain? Home sitters didn't have anybody to complain to. No one. Gordon's cabin is 150 feet from the stream. Many original homesteaders had to travel up to a mile for fresh water. I mean, this is this is some of the BS that kind of goes on around. Well, why wasn't somebody thinking that the water's way the crap down there? You know, why couldn't somebody just say, hey, don't you want to have a life? This isn't the only thing that has failed to impress Gordon during his first week on the frontier. Whoever is responsible for this, I'd like to be able to give them a nice little shave with this supposed sharp razor. And if this person's still living afterwards, I'll bite my words and I'll, I'll complain no more. This must be purposeful. The buttons popped off purposely so I could hold up my trousers. You know, my hat doesn't fit me in the head purposely so it blows off. So I look like a real Hulk. In 1883, do you think people actually had a box and had tea leaves in a box? Do you think it could be that revolutionary? Or a tea cutty. They, 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 they have tea wrapped in brown paper and the tea does, it's not even tied up. 
and it's like folded and all the tea just crapped all over the place and so there goes your tea just give me a break about 1883 man I mean he had a lot more going for him he's a lot more civilized he was in civilization he came out here to kind of find a better world and he brought some pretty competent things along with him but that isn't really been brought through with our historians and with our handlers but the clunes remind me of uh Sort of the reverse, but the Beverly Hillbillies moving to Hollywood. It's more like Hollywood moving to 1883. And, it's, and it makes it difficult because you're coming here with Hollywood attitude. You know, 1883 is different. And it takes a while for that transition to occur. And it's even more difficult when you're confronted with what you perceive as limited amount of food, uh, you, you get tired after a while of, you know, 6 o'clock a.m., 6 o'clock p.m. milking. Just all the things that re are required to sustain a family or sustain oneself on the frontier, all that's real now. It's nearly two weeks since they arrived, and the clunes have still not sorted out some of their most basic needs. I think it's not fair how guys get to stand up when they pee, and then me and Tracy came up with a way how to pee where girls stand up, and you just don't wear any underwear. Wait, okay. <laughs> Anya proves the point that the clunes need to build a previn and fast. Our younger brother Connor comes to the rescue with his shovel. This is a train for the outhouse. It's about, uh, I'd say three feet or, or something, or maybe even four feet deep. I am so, so known as like the digger. I've been digging with trains, wells, things like that. I've done that, that like all my life pretty much. I'd say the most fun um, hole I've dug would most likely be the, the train. Upstream at the glens, Logan already has a fully operational privy. I love it because you have plenty of room down there. It's so far down you don't you don't hear that much of a thump. And then the toilet right here is big enough for everybody's butt. There's no toilet paper on. There's certain leaves that are more advantageous than others. These are pretty good ones right here. These are big. So we do is we basically strip them off like that. You know, we clean our soles with that. You know, nobody gave us any training like what's going to give you a rash or what isn't. But there's something in this leaf that actually is a, it's a natural kind of a deodorant. We have the four rags, one for each member of the family. And you're responsible for keeping your rag clean and washing it after use. And if you come in here and your nail's empty, you can't use anybody else's rag. If they use leaves, that's great. You know, I just worry about rashes and bugs on the leaves. And, you know, in the wintertime, there's not going to be a whole lot of leaves to use. So, again, we're trying to guess pre-planned. Fourteen days since their arrival, the clunes finally cut a doorway into their cabin. Yeah. I won't hit a nail or anything. No, we're right there. Hey, Adrian, do you have a minute? I want to invite you into the Clune Castle. <laughs> now, you're in. Oh, that. fantastic. Yay. <laughs> oh, so uh, it's, it's a start. We're moving this, guys. <laughs> Watch your step, everyone, okay? Look at this. Wow, it's big. Right now, this is much more appreciated than even the Malibu has. Yeah, this is yeah, but great. Yeah, but Five star, definitely. I love it. I don't like this really much. I kind of want to go home, and I miss all the food, and I miss lots of people. I'm getting them all out, okay? Okay. We know in the morning we're going to be yelled at to start milking the cow. Mm -hmm. I every morning. We have to get used to the schedule, because... It's our job. It's our responsibility. Which is pretty crappy. 
Like, after we're done doing the cows and horses every day, we have to go wash all the clothes, everyone's clothes, which is all gross, especially the pants of the guys. I know, they never seem to pull them down when they go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> My fear is um, we have so many things to do here and I have to be a bit gruff and tough with my children. I have to bark orders. With some of them, I have to be like a marine sergeant. I worry that I might be a little too severe on them and I worry that I might drive them to hate this place, to hate me. But for their own good and for the good of the family, we have to get these chores done. I feel almost like I've been sentenced to five months hard labor. You just start early in the morning and work all day and start all over again the next day. And at times you just, you do get tired and you think, oh, you know, I'm going to do this for another four months. And the work is physically very demanding. So you're very tired by the end of the day. You just want to go to bed and sleep. Not only am I enjoying the entire experience, but I'm enjoying it with the people that I'm with. There are talents and there are things coming up now that we're seeing in each other that maybe we didn't know existed. Aaron has this affinity for animals that's unbelievable. And Logan has this real, is really developing this relationship with the outdoors. Last night he wouldn't come back in. It was freezing cold, but he wouldn't come back in because he's playing outside. And my wife, I always accuse her of micromanaging everything but you know I'm finding out that here somebody needs to micromanage because who has time to do the work and manage everything like that so am I enjoying it more so than I can ever describe hoist the mainsail trim the half sheet at the Brooks camp, progress is slow, even with Gordon and Mark occasionally helping out. Knowing they can't always rely on others, Nate and Rudy have created a homesteader's device, a simple hoist called a gin pole. This is a uh, frontier crane. We've uh, put this pole in. It allows you to pull up logs at, at any height. It's been great having the help from Mark and Gordon, but on the days when they're not able to, to come up, we still want to be able to be productive. So my father and I, if we're working here together, we can uh, pull up one of these, these logs on our own and get it into place. It's really been great working with my dad. At times I catch him, especially when his, his beard is starting to grow in and it's, uh, it's gray. He reminds me of my grandfather and, and making that realization that my father is starting to get, get older. And uh, that's a new experience to see uh, the, the signs of age uh, showing with him. It's, it's uh, just really thankful thankful to have have this time the clones are about to take another big step they are installing their cast iron stove this is going to be a challenge. Yeah. Oh, I love this stove. It is going to revolutionize my life. I feel like a new woman. Got up this morning, started up the stove, and we're warm. We had hot tea, hot coffee warm biscuits and I'm just radiant. This is wonderful. I tell you, I am in heaven. Heat. <laughs> warm water to wash your face with. 
This is the first cup of tea off our stove, you know, and I'm drinking it. <laughs> In a nation dependent on wood, the cast iron cook stove revolutionized domestic life in the 19th century. Five times more efficient than a fireplace, it was both a clean source of heat and an easier way to cook. But even the stove can't solve the clunes' latest problem. They fear they are running out of food. I'm really concerned about food, and so I'm watching how much we're using. I'm trying to ration it because I'm taking care of a family of six and two teenagers who appear to be ravenously hungry all the time. I mean, they're back half an hour, an hour after a meal looking for food, and they don't understand the concept of rationing. They've never had to do that before. Homesteaders knew hunger. Spring was called starving time, when winter reserves ran low. Yeah. Hey, you got these two food. Yeah. Not that big. Just put it down and wait till everyone gets here. Are they coming in? Yeah, coming in. Some settlers survived for months on simple dishes like cornmeal and milk. Adrian, you know, has a degree in food science out of Trinity College in, in, in Europe. She knows food, she knows how to cook, she knows how to prepare, she knows how to do a lot of things with little. But it's not fair to see someone as hardworking as my wife to be deprived and to see my kids, to see Connor uh, getting skinnier. It's just not fair. It's not right. <laughs> The two boys, Connor and Justin, they're losing weight. I'm really worried about them. The main thing the two boys have been eating is bread. The clunes are not out of food, but they've run low on several supplies, especially sweet goods. Today, the average American consumes 150 pounds of sugar a year, three times the amount that people ate in 1883. I can't handle any more bread or just about anything without something sweet to put on there, just the tiniest little bit of something. So, you know, I don't know, I, when I volunteered to do this, I never thought starvation was going to be one of the things we'd have to do, and I sure didn't think we'd be deprived this much. Can handle a lot. It's, like, it's just not fair. My animals are well fed, my children are well fed, and honey, if you didn't understand that when you applied for this, then you were just on some little glitz trip. Obviously, I'm not doing this to be in a damn movie. I look like hell. These are our reserves. This is where I keep it, under the bed. So out of sight, out of mind. Karen is annoyed because she has heard the clunes are complaining about their shortage of supplies. If they can't make it, then they need to ask for some help. If you're too arrogant to ask your neighbors for help, then you're either going to starve to death or you go home. I can come up with a hundred wines, just like everybody else. But we haven't been doing that. I, mean, I could use up all our supplies in one night. You make it last, just like you do at home, if you're used to working on a budget. But if you're not, then you're in hell in a handbasket. We still have... Over half a bottle of molasses, raisins, almost all of our olive oil, dried apples, prunes that everybody wants, and honey. You know the secret to honey? When you have about this much, when you've used about this much of your honey, go ahead and replace it with some warm water. It extends it, and it's easier to pour anyway. It's just being a little bit innovative. You don't need a college degree to figure out that you can kind of thin it down just a bit and still has a sweet kick to it. In 1883, if you were hungry, you could hunt game. Today's laws make it illegal for our families to kill out of season. But help is on its way from an unlikely source. The Crow Indian Tribe. In a gesture that turns history on its head, Dale Oldhorn, professor at the Little Bighorn College, harvested a mule deer to feed the families. 
That's better than that's good. That's good. Okay. Modern tribal law allows its members to hunt year-round on their reservation. Okay. The easiest way to skin it is to take your knife, pull the skin out, out like this, okay. and just get uh, cut right underneath it, and just take short cuts okay. to to about here. The irony is that in 1882, only a year before our family's time period, the crows still hunted and camped in Frontier Valley. But a disputed treaty turned the land over to the United States, and thereby, the homesteaders. Hey, that lives. I come here visiting all of you with mixed feelings, you know, uh, here's the homesteading and it reminds me of the time, 1883, when my people were so put upon. You see in history where the uh, huge, huge uh, buffalo slaughter going on, and the effect of that was that since it was a staple for the American Indians, the Indians began to starve, it was against government policy for Indians to hunt, and so they were starving the Indian people out. Not yet, Connor. You serve your guests first, always. In the decades following 1883, one out of every three crow starved to death. When the crow people were moved from this territory here, this very land we're sitting on, it was under gunpoint, and they were forced off. And so the concept that the homesteaders were coming onto free land was a wide misconception. The free land offered to homesteaders did have a high price, only it was paid for by the American Indians. The families know they can't depend on gifts of food, so they get going on a more lasting solution. For many original homesteaders, planting a garden would have been even more pressing than building a cabin. <laughs> As a first timer, I just kind of hold on, hold on, and uh, <laughs> try not to let go of it. Back for the day, livestock expert Rawhide Johnson is here to drive the team. I have a little trouble getting through the sod here, and then when we get through, it's just like pulling the carpet out of a whole warehouse all at one time, and then my little horses can't pull it. Many homesteaders were lured by advertisements claiming fortunes could be made from the fertile soils of Montana. As many discovered, busting sod was backbreaking work. Invigorating morning. At the glens, the sod is even tougher and full of roots and stones. Someone is going to have to describe to me how in gosh's name a guy that comes from Tennessee that was a school teacher comes up here and is able to run a plow and control everything through this and you know the breaking saw and stuff like that I know exactly what they're talking about now because it's amazing just running that plow behind it it's like it's easier it would be easier to drive a Ferrari than it would that plow the families abandon the plow in favor of the pitchfork and shovel their dreams of large crops have been scaled back. So when we start having vegetables, it's our vegetables. And I guarantee you what, too. About the first time I see a varmint out here, shotgun's coming off the lock, and I'm going to blow some heads off because they weren't in here doing this all day long. The Brooks take a different approach. We kind of revise the garden plans. We've raised the bed essentially, so that this airspace um, will hopefully keep a lot of the, the ground critters away. 
Each family has been given a small quantity of seeds and cuttings, similar to those brought west by the settlers. It's an integral part of our existence at this point. Our food supply is dwindling as soon as the salads are edible. They'll supplement what we have. I feel like I'm growing up a lot here because like before, like if I was in Temecula or California or wherever I used to live, like I wouldn't do anything. I would just sit on my butt and watch TV and then I just like, I was just a lazy person. But like now that I'm actually doing work, I feel like a better person. Like, you know, I'm actually doing something to help other people. I find the, the Clune family um, interesting and I think that they've made the greatest change and I see them as a family getting closer together and uh, will probably be a, a much stronger family unit when they leave here. After planting their garden, the Glenn family is eager to do more farming. So they use their savings to purchase a second milk cow and calf. This is our new cow, Jessica. Easy. And is that her calf? That's her baby. Easy. Faced with three cow-calf pairs in a corral that will only hold two, the Glens tell the Clunes to move their cow. Set your priorities. We housed their animals for almost three weeks until we got our other cow. Then we said, look, we just can't do this anymore. Well, but we don't have a corral. They see that they had every right for their calf to stay up here. Bullsh this is my property. That's my corral. When we bought it, it was here existing. Too bad. You don't have one. Build one. The clunes start work on a corral. The sense of community so eagerly anticipated is already under strain. They seem not to care, like at the very beginning. And so all of a sudden they're just like, you have to get your cow out of here, blah, blah, blah. It's not our cow. So it kind of made me mad. Many a fight between pioneers centered around their livestock. One of America's most famous family feuds between the Hatfields and the McCoys left 12 men dead and was sparked off by an errant pig. I just think the Glens should be a little, like, more understanding that we need to keep the cow there for a little bit longer, but they're making us get rid of it tomorrow. I don't understand, like, why they would be all nice about, like, being all friendly with neighbors. They, like, they talk so much crap. Actions speak louder than words. And they don't understand that. I think because they're West Coast cutie pies that they can't hang. And I feel like because we're from Tennessee and we're a little stronger stock, does that make it right? No. Because families then were a little bit tougher. And those were the ones that stayed and succeeded. It is not fair. If they couldn't eke it out, then you know what? In 1883, what would they do? They would go home. And if that's what happens, you know, I'll help them pack. Cool people. It is mid-June. The rest of the nation is enjoying summer. The Frontier Valley is hit by a freak snowstorm. The family's freshly planted gardens are buried under nine inches. Still snowing heavily. Every few minutes you hear a big crash and a creaking, and what it is is tree limbs falling off the trees all around the place here. Here's one that just came down over here near our old kitchen. And there goes one right now. That one just came down right now, right in front of us. I don't know, but the girls need to go milking. They're going to have to be awfully careful. Girls, come on, you go. I don't know, I don't know how many socks or shoes. I can't really run outside with bare feet. We can't get the girls' clothes dry. I washed their clothes Monday, laundry day, and it poured rain. And so they're still wet. I'm still trying to dry them. So they have no clothes to wear. They're in there just in chemises trying to put blankets around themselves so they can go milking. <laughs> Tracy, there is nothing else to wear. Here's the skirts from Monday, washed, 
It's still wet, still damp, and this is the dress. Still damp as well. The clown's milk cow escaped from their new corral, and the girls think she's gone back to the glens. <laughs> Are the milk buckets ready? <laughs> Now remember, you not to walk directly under the trees, you hear? Stay on just the trail. The girls, with nothing to wear except blankets, needed to go milk the cows. It was just ridiculous. They didn't even have underwear to wear, really. And it just made me feel really inadequate and guilty, like I should have been able to think further ahead. We can't do this. We had a walk, like almost a mile in the snow, which is about maybe 10 inches like deep. And I didn't have any clothes, so I had to go outside with a blanket and two gloves for my socks. I was kind of expecting to throw snowballs at everyone. Didn't happen. <laughs> Oh, my leg's numb. I can't feel it. It's burning. I almost got killed, too, because there was a branch that almost, like, snapped in front of me and Anya, and that was really scary. <laughs> like, stop. Ah! No. Hey! Really? No! Right there! Run! <laughs> <laughs> Run! As expected, their cow and calf return to the glens. Then when we got there, it was just freezing. My legs were numb all the way up to my knees. I couldn't feel them. That was like one of the worst days of my life. What? What? Because she's staying up here. And we had the calf up here all last night too, suckling from her and from our other cows. Did you guys know that? Hey, Dusty. You guys know that? Huh? They escaped. Well, you should have come up and gotten them. Don't milk her here because she'll get used to being milked here. Milk her at your corral so she's used to being milked there. Okay? Right. Why? 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 Okay? Especially because of the calf. Now we're worried about the calf because it was sick this morning from eating all night long. The issue that I had uh, this morning with the girls milking their cow at our house, it irritated me a little bit when I said, you know, it'd be better if you milk at your pen. And Tracy said, well, I'm going to milk here anyway. Well, you know what? I got news for you. This isn't your property. It's my property. It's our property. And these are our animals. And we're trying to do what's best for our animals. And what's not best is to have a calf running around here loose all night with our cows because it takes away from our calves, too. Hey, ladies. Hey. Nate was on his way to the glens, having been invited to coffee. Yeah, doing? Not very good. Your hands getting cold? No, oh, my legs are cold. This is all I have to wear. Here, give me a turn. No, that's okay. Give me a You should get up and walk around. You don't want to get too cold. Uh, community. There isn't any community. So there are three different homesteads and we're all trying to get it together and get it going as best as possible.
you can get your hands because all you'll, all you'll get is a uh, frostbite on your toes. And then you have to take the cow back. I'll, go, I'll get the cow. <laughs> forget about the, the camel, forget about everything else. Just concentrate on getting your feet warmed up and getting back to your place. <laughs> Alright? I am so community vested, but I also know that there's a limit. A lot of it's respect. This is this isn't really yet community to me because no one's had to um, really ask the other neighbor for help until you really need a friend or you need a neighbor. It's not community. I think back to the folks in 1883 that, that came out this way. You could have the best intentions of, of coming out and, and starting a life here. And it only takes, you know, one broken leg or a, a weather storm that came in or animals eating your crop. And before you know it, you're bust.